In my uh, last video, I talked about something that the Pope is now calling a paradigm shift in theology. And I talked about how confusing and muddled it really seemed to be, the lack of definition in key terms, and how it seemed to be sort of, you know, what it says is that it's giving privileged position to uh, the common sense of people. And then it acknowledges that the common sense of people often have very inadequate ideas of God. So I don't know how that becomes a useful source for theology. And it, it reminds me something very much as what I experienced back in the uh, 70s and 80s. I remember the Catholic Theological Society commissioned a study on human sexuality. And this is what these issues are really revolving around. And it, uh, the committee that they appointed came up with a statement that said, uh, even though objectively this thing looks like adultery in certain circumstances that might really not be. And so it listed kind of a new set of criteria for judging the morality of actions and it, things like, you know, life affirming, joyous, uh, you know, very, various other things like that. And it says, so in certain situations, what what is objectively adultery, having sex with somebody who's somebody else's wife, uh, really could be okay. And it says, of course, we need to be careful about how we approach this. We need to be prudent. But it basically, it opened, opened the door and implied that there aren't absolute moral uh revelation that uh, always and everywhere uh, are true. And of course, this is what John Paul II fought this battle and he issued an encyclical called Very Taught to Splendor saying, as a matter of fact, there are some moral absolutes. There are some things that are always and everywhere wrong and, and evil, and it doesn't depend on the circumstances. This also reminds me of a catechism that Father Richard McBrien published. He was chairman of the theology department at Notre Dame at that time. And uh, when he kind of issued kind of uh, or taught about principles for discernment, he said, well, you have divine revelation. Then you have <clears throat> the theology of, a, of different theologians. And then you have human experience. And somehow you need to take all these things into account in deciding what's right and wrong. So it isn't like divine revelation kind of is the informing principle you use. It may be a theological opinion. It may be human experience. So uh, this, of course, was corrected by a number of bishops' conferences. A number of bishops' conferences said Father McBrien's uh, catechism is not a reliable source for guidance in uh, Catholic doctrine in these areas. So now we have a, a document from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and this is the Vatican office uh, commissioned to keep an eye on Catholic doctrine, to promote it, and also to correct error when needed. And recently it published a document that was a response to questions that a Brazilian bishop asked about uh, the possibility of transgender people being involved in various sacramental situations. So here's the first question. Can a transsexual be baptized? And this is the answer that the congregation gave. Uh, the new head of the congregation, of course, is Archbishop Fernandez, who's been a longtime main theological source for uh, Pope Francis. This is the answer. A transsexual who, who had also undergone hormone treatment, and sex reassignment surgery can receive baptism under the same conditions as other believers if there are no situations in which there's a risk of generating public scandal or disorientation among the faithful. In the case of children or adolescents with transgender issues, if well-prepared and willing, they can receive baptism. Now, the normal conditions for Receiving baptism is desiring to live a Catholic life, desiring to embrace the teachings of the faith, uh, desiring to grow in holiness. And that involves turning away from serious sin. That involves uh, believing what the church teaches. And so <clears throat> 
when when the congregation for doctrine of faith says, well, actually, it's possible to do it using the same conditions, but then it says there may be situations in which there's a risk of generating public scandal or disorientation among the faithful. Well, I would say that for sure, in almost every situation, there's a risk of causing confusion or generating public scandal or disorientation among the faithful. But what a lot of pastors and maybe some bishops are going to do is say, well, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith says it's fine to baptize transgender adults and transgender children. Uh, and, And they're not going to pay too close attention to whether the people being baptized are really repudiating uh, the grave sin they committed in severely mutilating their bodies and not accepting uh, the sex that God gave them in, in their creation. And there's lots of documents, including Vatican documents and documents of different bishops that say, no, there's not a difference between sex and gender, and that people who are having gender confusion need to resolve their confusion, not by choosing another gender, but by dealing with the underlying psychological trauma problems that have caused the gender confusion, and they need to embrace and accept how God created them as a male or female and work out the issues that are causing the confusion and get the healing they need. So that's going to be a problem. There's going to be uh, confusion, disorientation. People are going to say, hey, what's going on here? Uh, Here's this guy who's dressing like a woman, uh, who's wearing nail polish and makeup and uh, who knows what else, getting baptized. Are they repudiating? Are they are they regretting what they've done? Are they embracing a, a decision to live according to the sex that God gave them or not? And it's going to be pretty confusing. And then it goes to say that um, – Baptism should be open to everybody. And then they quote Thomas Aquinas that says that, you know, if there is some question about people's sincerity and repentance, even though the baptism is validly conferred, uh, it isn't fruitful in a person's life. But if later on that repentance could become fruitful. And so it sort of gives the impression that, well, let's baptize people even if they aren't repenting, even if they are choosing to live in serious sin, uh, because maybe sometime down the road, uh, the indelible mark that comes from baptism uh, will be activated. That's possible, but that's not really what the church is teaching and what what Thomas Aquinas teaches. I wrote a whole article called The Post, Post-Christendom of uh, Sacramental Crisis, where I went into some depth on the teaching of ba- Thomas Aquinas on receiving baptism. And he clearly says that uh, if somebody doesn't have faith in the sacrament, somebody doesn't believe, somebody doesn't desire the sacrament, he shouldn't be baptized. And it, really, it, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So the document goes on to say, even when doubts remain about a person's objective moral situation or about his or her subjective dispositions towards grace, one should never forget this aspect of the faithful of God's unconditional love. So even when a purpose of amendment does not appear in a fully manifest way in the penitent, uh, the church should always call to live out fully all the implications of baptism. So it's saying that, you know, even when the person doesn't intend to repent, even when the person isn't sorry for what he's done, it sort of says, go ahead and baptize them anyway, but call them on to, to conversion to Christian life. Well, all I can say is that's going to cause a lot of confusion, and a lot of disorientation in the church, because it's going to appear like the church is accepting unrepentant transgender people. That's what it's going to appear like. Second question is, can a transgender person be a godparent or a godmother? This is a very, very short answer here. Under certain conditions, an adult transsexual who had also undergone hormone treatment and sex reassignment surgery may be admitted to the task of godfather or godmother. However, since this task does not constitute a right, pastoral prudence demands that it should not be allowed if there is a danger of scandal, undue legitimization, or disorientation in the educational sphere of the church community. So, um... It's saying that 
transsexual people can be godparents, but uh, it could cause confusion. Uh, pastoral prudence needs to be used, and we shouldn't allow this if there's a danger of scandal, undue legitimization, or disorientation in the educational sphere of the church community. Well, I think what this does is take away any backing that a priest has who really knows that this is the wrong direction to go in, who knows that it doesn't make sense for a transgender person to vouch for the Catholic upbringing of a baby or of an adult who's becoming a Catholic through baptism. What are they going to do? I mean, they're going to say, hey, uh, do what you're being taught, but don't do have what I'm teaching. Don't do what I'm living. Don't do what I've chosen in, in a pu very public way. So I think it's going to make it hard, even though the document allows for a pastor to uh, to not allow somebody to be a godparent uh, who's transgender, openly transgender, uh, uh, if there's a danger of scandal. But it's going to be really hard because people are going to have a general impression. Well, Pope Francis says it's okay and not really pay attention to the restrictions or not have the courage to uh, explain the restrictions to people under the pressure. Next question, can a transgender person be a witness at a wedding? And the answer is one sentence. There's nothing in current universal kind of law that prohibits a transgender person from being a witness to, in a marriage. So there's nothing in kind of law against it. But is it a good idea? Is it a good idea to have people sort of like publicly witnessing to Catholic marriage who themselves uh, are living a public contradiction of it in many, many ways? Uh, it, it, you know, it's not in canon law, but maybe it should be in canon law. You know, maybe, maybe some, some guidance should be given here. Okay. Next thing, can two homo-affective persons <clears throat> figure as parents of a child who must be baptized and who was adopted or obtained by other methods such as sur surrogacy? Well, there's again a one-sentence answer because there is something in kind of law about something that pertains to this. For the child to be baptized, there must be a well-founded hope that he or she will be educated in the Catholic religion. Now, Two homo-affective people, whatever that means, I guess it means people who, I don't know, I don't know exactly what it means. I guess it's people who um, have a baby through adoption, two homosexuals who have a baby through adoption or through surrogacy, which the Catholic Church also says is very, very wrong. Uh, can they... Can they be parents of a child and bring the child to baptism? And it quotes kind of law says there needs to be a reasonable hope of the child being raised in the faith. Is there a reasonable hope of a child being raised in the faith by two people who are in a homosexual relationship and have maybe used surrogacy to uh, get the child? I mean, what, what realistic hope of, of raising that child in the faith really is there? <sighs> And then finally, can a person who is homo-effective and cohabiting be godfather to a baptized person? Uh, this is a slightly different. The first issue is transgender people being godparents. This one is about cohabiting homosexuals be godfather to a baptized person. And then the answer is, according to Canon 874, anyone who possesses the aptitude and leads a life in conformity with the faith and with the office he or she assumes can be a godparent. Different is the case where the cohabitation of two homo-effective persons consists not in a simple cohabitation, but in a stable and declared relationship that appears as marriage well known to the community. So basically it's saying that the two people are living in a homosexual relationship, but they haven't publicized it as a marriage relationship to the community, they can be godparents. It says, in any case, due pastoral prudence demands that every situation be wisely weighed in order to safeguard the sacrament of baptism, and especially its reception. At the same time, it is necessary to consider the real value the church community places on the duties of godparents and godmothers, the role they play in the community, and the consideration they show toward the teaching of the church. And then it basically says, hey, you know, 
this not really may really this may not really be the case in the situations we're talking about is two people living in a homosexual relationship who knows how they got the child and it says maybe there may be another person from the family circle to act as guarantor of the proper transmission transmission of the catholic faith to the baptizing person should also be taken into account, knowing that one can still assist the baptizing person during the rite, not only as godfather or godmother, but also as witnesses to the baptismal act. So what we're going to be seeing is a lot more openly gay people, openly transsexual people uh, being very visible in the Catholic Church, uh, taking part in sacraments, and it's going to be very hard for the average Catholic who doesn't know all the nuances in this document. And it's going to be very hard for the average pastor to resist pressure to allow people like this to appear on the altar in sacraments. And I think it's going to be very disorienting no matter how careful and pastorally prudent the priests may be. I think it's going to leave some people, unfortunately, to say, I'm out of here. This is becoming a gay church, you know. Uh, I'm out of here. Or it's going to maybe have them to go to Orthodox Church, which wouldn't hear about this thing. So I don't know. I, I think it's so. I think it's an open door, despite the nuances, despite the conditions. I think it's an open door to confusion, an open door to continuing to give the impression that really we're moving in a different direction. We're moving to normalize homosexuality in the church. And even though we're not openly denying doctrine by the pastoral loopholes we're putting in here, it's going to happen. So all I want to say is God help us. God save the church. Uh, I myself, of course, as I said many times, would never leave the Catholic Church. It's it's a church that's clearly been founded by Christ. It's the Holy Church of Christ, the Holy Church of God, despite all the, the confusion, despite all the infidelity, despite all the sin, despite all the rebellion, despite all the foolishness. It's our church, and it's the Church of Christ, and it's the only church that has the fullness of the means of salvation in it. And boy, we need to pray and work for renewal and repentance and revival uh, in our own lives, in our own church situations, and we need to uh, defend the truth in whatever opportunities we have to do it and not meekly give in to uh, things that are seeming to give the impression that, hey, you know, the church is changing, homosexuality is okay. And I know that transgenderism isn't the same as homosexuality, but the the repudiation of God's plan for sexuality and marriage is very, very grave, whatever form it takes. It's not rocket science. God created us male and female for the purpose of coming together in holy marriage, open to life. That's it. And every exercise of sexuality outside of holy marriage between a man and a woman, uh, every mutilation of the body trying to deny the sex that we've been created with is a grave sin. And we need to love people who are suffering these temptations, love people who have fallen into uh, these traps, and do all we can to uh, pray and, and sacrifice for their salvation. But we can't agree that this is a good direction for us or the church to go in. There's one other thing I want to say before we draw it to a conclusion. This contradiction going on at the highest levels of the church. In 2015, uh, a bishop in Mexico, a no, bishop in Spain, asked the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the same Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, whose document we've just gone through, about the matter of a transgender person becoming a godparent. This was the response with the approval of the Pope. That, that came to this bishop. About this particular matter of a transsexual person being a godparent, I communicate to you the impossibility that it is admitted. The same transsexual bit behavior reveals in a public manner an attitude opposed to the moral demand of resolving the problem of one's own sexual identity according to the truth of one's own sex. Therefore, the result is evident. For this person does not possess the requisite of leading a life conformed to the faith and to the position of Godfather. Canon 874, section number 1, 3. Therefore, 
he is not able, this person is not able to be admitted to the position of godmother nor godfather. One should not see this as discrimination, but only the recognition of an objective absence of the requisites that by their nature are necessary to assume the ecclesial responsibility of being a godparent. And then, eight years later, we have a very mushy, different kind of answer that opens the door explicitly to transgender people being godparents. Nobody wants to look at it, but there's a contradiction between the doctrinal tradition of the church on these matters, uh, even within the last eight years. Not only that, but there's a, there's a contradiction within the last two years. I think in 2021 it was, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith was asked another question about whether it's okay to bless same-sex unions. And the answer came back very clearly. No, it is not permissible to bless same-sex unions because you can't bless sin. Now, you think that's really a straightforward, really clear answer. But then in 2022, the person appointed to lead the uh, synod, Cardinal Hollerick, in uh, several interviews, said he doesn't believe that the Catholic teaching on homosexuality is solidly based and that we need to go along with the latest developments in science whatever they may be. And then the German bishops have kind of basically signed on in favor of same-sex unions, and the uh, northern Belgian bishops, the Flemish bishops, have done the same thing. And uh, a bishop of Germany just kind of gave the go-ahead to his priest to go ahead and start doing it. And, uh, and then right before the synod opened in October of 2023, uh, the Pope kind of responded to another dubia personally, basically saying that the, the door is open to blessing same-sex relationships if we use pastoral prudence and take into account the circumstances and don't give the impression that it's the same as marriage. And uh, so <sighs> there used to be stability, there used to be continuity, and I, I think we're in serious trouble right now. But hey, Jesus is Lord, right? God's got a plan to bring good out of this pretty terrible situation. Uh, before we conclude, in just a few minutes, I'd like to uh, say something about three articles that we're linking below the, the video here. I don't often do this, but there's some really excellent articles that have been published recently that fill in the picture. What I've been trying to do here in this video is to show how strange and ambiguous and unclear what this document really means and how it really opens the door truly for scandalizing people and giving a counter witness to what the truth of the faith really is in this whole area. But these articles really fill in the picture. There's an article by John Birch, who's a really high-level lawyer. Uh, he's been a guest on our Choices We Face programs, and he's written an excellent article about what the document should have said to close the door to uh, inappropriate applications and inappropriate understandings. Monsignor Charles Pope, our longtime friend from Washington, D.C., who's been a guest on The Choices We Face many times, has also written an excellent article about the only possible way of interpreting this document in an orthodox way. Very clear, very helpful. And then there's an article by Chris Rufo, who uh, goes into where the whole thing has come from. Where is this whole powerful current of transgender kind of power? Where is it coming from? And how? why has everybody embraced it? And what's the spiritual power behind it? Very interesting. None of the articles are too long. I really like to urge you to please read them as a compliment to this video. Uh, again, uh, we're going to continue to talk about issues that are important to us and to the church today. So I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Renewal Ministries YouTube channel. Just click on the subscribe button, click on the blue bell, uh, so that you'll get a notification every time that myself or Peter Herbeck do a new video. And uh, thanks for being with us on this really exciting journey. But it's also really, really great that we know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. His word is true. 
that everything the sacred authors assert in the sacred scripture is asserted by the Holy Spirit, and it teaches faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths that God wished to consign to the sacred writings for our salvation. And that truth has come to us for 2,000 years, unbroken, and we'll see what's going to happen. God bless you.